cool geeks doing good stuff. Hang and on. hang on. Apparently they're not getting any audio. Oh, great. <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> There's nobody saw a thing. We'll fix it in post. Um, Cool. I'm still Gray. I'm uh, still the executive director of World Builders. <laughs> and I'm still Zay, the director of operations. We also have a special guest joining us today. See you, Woo! Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> nice to be here. Thank you for making my weekend a very ah. fun one. I, uh, <laughs> I, I have. I'm. Gonna, I'm so looking forward to this. Uh, this discussion. But first, we of course have to do our announcements and stuff. Um, and uh, while your book is coming out in May, yep. um, Patricia Briggs just had a book come out today. And uh, I have we right have it here. in stock at World Builders, Wild yeah. Sign. Um, and Ooh, that's so, the same artist that did my cover. Dan Dos Santos. Yes, he's yeah, amazing. Yeah. It's yeah. The same artist. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, small world. Great. <laughs> um, so, yeah, feel free. It's uh, right on our front page of worldbuildersmarket.com. And of course, all the books that you order from there help us to do our work in trying to uh, create sustainable change that benefits marginalized people throughout the world. He said, seeing the admission statement up on my wall right next to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so yeah, the, that's that's the uh, official business. Now we have to go to trivia questions. And I, I'm kind of proud because I was the one who wrote this trivia question. Um, uh, all, my, all my fellow Valdemar fans, you know, raise your hands in the audience. Um, and this is from one of the Valdemar books by Mercedes Lackey. And it's about someone named Skiff, who started as an orphaned pickpocket, as so many heroes do, um, but ended up as a hero of Valdemar in the world created by Mercedes Lackey and illustrated by Larry Dixon, uh, who we is one of uh, world builders favorite people. Um, what was the name of Skiff's chosen companion? And we'll see if any of you can go ahead and put that in the uh, answer. Yes, the Larry Dixon. It's going to, uh, <laughs> uh, and the answer was Simri. At least that's how I pronounce it. It might be pronounced a different way. Um, and Simri also happens to be a big, beautiful white horse um, that it was portrayed in the book. And that that whole series has a whole series of things about it that are take me way back to you know my early days of reading fantasies and stuff like that. So salacious crumb. No, <laughs> it is not. Nate Taylor's here. Oh my God! Speaking of good illustrators. Um, for our new trivia question, which I'm just going to jump into. Do it. Go for it. Um, as you guys all know, please put your answers in our DMs on any of our social media platforms or questions at worldbuilders.org. Do not put the new ones in the chat as you'll spoil it. <laughs> um, <laughs> for, uh, for the new trivia question, Mortimer, Bella, and Cassandra are members of the same family. What is the Sutter name of this Sims family? That is an interesting one. Um, yeah, DM us uh, and be entered into our monthly trivia prize draw. No, I never, I never got into Sims. No, I mean, admittedly, for me, I didn't do a lot of video games, but Sims especially, I'm like, I have enough trouble with my own life. Why would I want to have somebody <laughs> else's? Are, are you a Sims Sims fan? No. I haven't played Sims at all, um, but Nandy plays it a lot, and yeah, I, I was thinking about that. <laughs> I watch her play it a lot and just laugh. <laughs> yeah, that comes like a lot fun. of the video games that I look at. I just t tend to not, uh, not not do that. So um, it is time for our interview. So thank you for joining us, C. Uh, we appreciate it, and um, I'm going to read the the bio that came in the official letter that was in the galley that that. We got sent. Um, so Sui Davies Okungboa is a Nigerian author of speculative fiction inspired by his West African origins. He is the author of the NAMO award-winning David Mogo God Hunter, and his shorter works have appeared in Lightspeed, Nightmare, Strange Horizons, and other periodicals and anthologies. 
He lives between Lagos, Nigeria and Tucson, Arizona, where he teaches writing while completing his MFA in creative writing. So you're saying you really need a hobby is what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> Um, and I, I can say it personally, I read this uh, galley uh, last weekend. It was a, I got to take an entire day and just dive into it and live in that world for an entire day. And oh my God, it was great. It was so much fun. There were, there were moments when I like sat up and went, oh shit, no way, you gotta be kidding. That couldn't have happened, and it totally did. So, um, it's going to be hard to to do this without giving away spoilers. But we're going to do our best. <laughs> uh, also, for those of you in the audience, we're also giving away this particular Ooh. edition. In it only been read once um, uh, as part of this, but you will get it. The book comes out in in May, right? Of twenty yes. twenty one, yes. and so you would get it early. Uh, and I'm sure that our producers and engineer will put in the chat how to enter the drawing um, when we do that. But um, uh, to talk about the, the book a little bit, um, it, you talked about being inspired um, by your uh, uh, West African origins. Um, mm -hmm. In particular, it was the, the Benin Empire. Am I pronouncing <laughs> that right? <laughs> yeah, Benin Empire. Benin. Benin. Empire. Benin. Yeah. Um, and can you Talk a little bit about that and how the, the that particular history inspired for this book. Sure, sure. Um, well, to start with, I often like to start by like um, differentiating because often I would say the Benin Empire, and then folks would go look on a map of West Africa, <clears throat> and they, they they'd see the um, the country that is the Benin Republic, <laughs> which is a completely different mm -hmm. um, country from the Benin Empire. So the Benin Republic is what is likely what what used to be known back in the day as the Dahomey Empire um so I, I know someone a recent book has drawn from that culture I think it was Namina Forna's um mm -hmm. the, gilded the Gilded Ones yeah, yeah drew from that one yeah so that is a separate that's a different Benin right Benin City is a small you know city in southern Nigeria right it's somewhere in the Midwest uh and it was Back then in like the 15th, 16th-ish century, it used to span from almost the West to like the Mideast of what is now Nigeria. And so it used to be like a much larger kingdom. Uh, and a, a lot of it like circled around the coasts, right? Um, of, of again, what is now Nigeria. And and so I am from Benin City. I was born, raised in Benin City. My parents live in Benin City right now. Um, and, and one of the things that happened was like, I, I often used to see a lot of stuff, right? You, you go to the center of the town, you see the, the city, you'd see like um, statues, right? Old, they'd be there like crumbling or, or you'd see like some really built up walls, but like that are like half crumbling. And, in the beginning, it just felt like, well, this is a really old city that like all of this new urban stuff has been like built around something much more ancient um, than what we're seeing. And at the center of the city as well, there's a museum <laughs> that also collects a lot of this history. But uh, while I was growing up, it was like really run down. People didn't go uh, there a lot or people don't like people from Benin City barely go. It's often outsiders who go and stuff like that anyway. Um, but I guess, you know, as I started telling stories myself, one of the things I noticed was that it, I wanted to tell stories that felt, um, you know, like they were representing this varied fractured selves, right? That people like me um, engage with, right? You're, 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 thinking about, you know, the, the you that is now an accumulation of all these things that you have accumulated all the, um, all of this time, right? Especially post-colonial period. But then you're also thinking about the history of what has come before and how that's in, you know, informing who we, who, how that informs the people who informed us, right? So it's, it's like, when I started thinking more and more about these things, I said, okay, I write, write stories of the fantastic. So I wanted to write, uh, stories of the fantastic, but root them in a time and place that is more, you know, very familiar to me and people like me. So 
So one of the first places I did was uh, I went to was Benin, right? I went back to my parents' house. I was like, all right, all right, guys, where are your archives or whatever? Like, show me all the old stuff. <laughs> and so um, I dug. Your parents were academics, through. weren't they? Yeah, my parents are both academics. So they did have some stuff, but not a lot because they're, they're in the sciences. So they don't have like a lot of that. Um, so I actually had to start doing some legwork. Uh, I visited Benin the last time I visit, I like traveled to Nigeria. I think this was like in 2019-ish. Um, uh, yeah, I think so. So I, I went back. I went to Benin, I went to the museum, I went to some of these sites um, that are like heritage sites. Um, uh, so a, a good example is there's this street in Benin city called Igun Street, and what they do is they make bronze work, right? And and the people in Benin, the Benin craft workers have been like the most, uh, what's the word? They, they've been like the most skilled craft workers for like, you know, eons in that region. And that street is still there up until this day. It's been taken over by like more recent craft workers and all of that. But if you walk the streets, you see, see, you still see like one or two people who can tell you some stuff. So we did some of that, you know, I visited some places. It was really great. Um, and I was like, I just cannot not write <laughs> about these things. Um, and yeah, I'd already started this story uh, in somewhat a slightly ten different direction, but I sort of like pulled in all of these influences. And then I started to realize that these, this empire itself didn't exist on its own. It had all these connections to these other empires, you know, the Senegal, Gambia, um, the Dahomey, the Ghana, um, and all, all of these empires that orbited it. Um, and so I started to <laughs> research those as well, you know, look at what, you know, what, what, where the center central points for them, how did they rise, how did they fall, stuff like that. Um, yeah, and then I brought all of this together into think about how I could think about this empire in this book, which is a completely different empire, not the same thing at all, but um, it sort of informed how I how I realized that empires that were rooted in this particular place and time that I was drawing from, these are the things that actually fuel them. This is what drove them. This is what they thought was important and I could draw on that and use in my own fiction. Yeah, this is like quite a project. That is some serious <laughs> world building. Yeah. World right. walking. <laughs> um I so you have um I'm wondering so in your own world building uh, are there particular aspects um, of the culture that you absolutely wanted to include in your world or absolutely you wanted to like leave out? Mm. Yeah, I would say, I would say yes. Um, so one of the things, for instance, that was completely different from what, um, uh, what obtains in most places is um, religious practices. Um, I was, uh, I decided to invent completely new ones um, uh, and, and just sort of like uh, think about w what religions could arise from the from the physical right and and phys physical and and you know geographical and all of, all the other stuff that that exists in that world in the story because I didn't want to re-represent what currently exists because that is um, tricky it's 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 important for people who still exist today uh, and I don't want to like trivialize that so um, I, I ensure to leave that out specifically um, other things I was you know I, I, I mostly borrow just a tiny bit what I tend to do when I build world is I only take a slice and I sort of build a fictional thing around it and so that way it's hard to tell which is real and which isn't <laughs> which is my plan anyway um, and then and then from from borrowing stuff, a lot of what I borrowed was like the the visual stuff, right? Um, clothing, um, hairstyles, um, what how people thought think about value, you know, and and why they think about value, what what they value and why they value those things, stuff like that. Um, I borrowed some. I just sometimes lifted off completely. Uh, the dressing, for instance, that's very present in Son of the Storm because a lot, large part of Son of the Storm happens in the city of Basa. I borrowed from the Ghanaian um, um, ethnic groups that um, existed in 
the time of the Ghana Empire. <clears throat> and, and people in Ghana, you know, the traditional wear, sometimes people in Ghana still dress that way, especially the Akan tribes. There's a way they use their wrappers. So in the cover, right, um, these, this um, way, the, the, the exactly, <laughs> the way the, the clothing is like put across the shoulder, um, specifically from, um, you know, that Akan ethnic group in Ghana. So just stuff like that. Sometimes they just pull this like one thing, um, but then invent something completely on top of that. And that way it's kind of like mixed and matched. Um, that's really what I did for the most part. But yes, I did a lot of borrowing in the visual sense, but in terms of like um, practices and values, I mostly invented them um, from the world itself. Um, I also have... Uh... Uh, the advantage of gotten to, in the back of this book is another interview that you did. So this is this is a little bit of a, a question drawn from that. Or one of the interesting things about it is that um, your characters don't necessarily fall into the the typical D and D you know character archetypes like <laughs> of the you know the orphan pickpocket that we just talked about or the whole mm -hmm. you know fighter magic user elf bard wizard dragon mage with a half twist eleven you know that kind of thing. Um, so. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk about how you, how do you choose and develop your character's background and how that, I mean, you're, you're writing in some ways, you're writing within a genre of epic fantasy where certain things have to happen, but you're doing it to different characters. So how does, you know, they can't just say, oh, I'm going to pull out my sword and hack their head off. How does yeah. that change? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question because that's something I, I think and talk about all the time. Um, to start with, it helps that I've never played D&D. &D. <laughs> uh, to start with no I have never so played. I've heard so much about D&D &D and I'm like that's great you know I've seen Stranger Things and I'm like okay this is good um, this looks cool but I've never played it um, and so I guess I'm not often drawing from that specific culture if I should put it that way um, and then the second thing is also I guess what my impression of epic fantasy has been if has been, you know, my impression of epic fantasy has been filtered through when I'm consuming these works that are sort of supposed to be like seminal, right, in terms of um, the genre or the subgenre. I'm thinking about where that work is coming from and where I am reading from. Um, and then there are parts where I'd be like, yeah, I wouldn't do this if I was writing this because um, this wouldn't apply to where I come from or where I'm writing from. Um, and I wouldn't, that wouldn't fly with me. Um, and if I'm writing to represent myself and represent, you know, um, other readers who would like to see this kind of representation either for themselves or people um, affiliated with them, they probably wouldn't want to see this too. So in that way, I sort of arrive at this place where I'm really picking and choosing <laughs> what I want to represent and what I don't want to represent. And this is from the outset. This isn't you know, midway, and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do this. So um, in, in fact, actually, I did more of, maybe I want to do this one thing, <laughs> right, uh, and do this one other thing, just so at the core, you pick this book up, you read it, and you're like, okay, this is an epic fantasy novel, but eh, is it though? <laughs> you know, <laughs> in, in that way. Uh, and I like that. I want that, because that's the whole point of broadening the subgenre in a sense. So, um, uh, yeah, so that's pretty much how I approached it. Uh, that's how I approach storytelling in general. Um, I'm always thinking about the gaze, right? About the gaze where the, the, the seminal works of the subgenre are coming from and where I want to write from. Am I writing toward that? Am I right? How am I writing toward that? How am I writing against that? How am I writing tangentially? How am I writing to subvert something? Um, so I do that a lot. Um, one of the things I do, I know this is something that's already out there. It's not a spoiler, but like there are beasts in this book, right? And folks here, magical beasts and then, you know, epic fantasy. So you think, you think of an idea of what you think a magical beast in a fantasy novel is going to look like. And then I'm like, yeah, you'd be completely surprised what you will come I, across. I, I agree. I agree. I, I, I wish... Uh... I, I, I won't I won't spoil it either, but yeah, you're absolutely right. There is there is a, a major magical beast in there that I'm like it totally what? once they appeared, <laughs> but in my head the version of what it looked like was very different. So yeah. <laughs> very, very fun. Um 
And actually that, that kind of, when you're talking about, you know, representing and, and, and things you want to subvert and stuff like that, um, uh, one of the key characters uh, who also happens to be one of my favorites and uh, in your interview, you say that she's one of your favorites as well. Um, and is going to be a big part of the rest of the series. Um, she shows up really late in the book and, and uh, I'm gonna let you decide how much you want to talk about her. I'm more, cons I'm more curious because normally, I mean, characters that show up late in the book, you're like, oh, this is an incidental. And suddenly, um, you know, not only is she not incidental, but she's a very major part of things. Um, was that something that was always planned? Like in the beginning, you had an outline or did she just like show up, you know, and say, no, 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 you think I'm an incidental character, but really I'm a big part of this, you know? I know yes. sometimes that happens. <laughs> yes, 100% um, yes, that is exactly what happened. Um, I did not have her in the plan at all. Um, so the thing is when I started this story, I even just had two characters, right? That's it, I just had two people. I was like, okay, everything's gonna orbit these two people. Um, but the, uh, the, the main point for Son of the Storm and the name of Republic as a series in general, for me was I was trying to think about how one person, right, makes a decision for themselves and that sort of has a knock-on effect and sort of spirals out of control. And then what do they do to fix it? And how, what if the thing they did to fix it worsened it even more? That's pretty much, um, <laughs> that's pretty much um, what I was thinking about. Uh, and so you have this, you know, you have Danso, who's the main character, and he's a scholar, you know, he is just trying to find answers for himself. But every time he opens a door, he like opens 10 more trap doors that, you know, as a result, and all the, these things come back to him. But I realized that you can't just have these people opening up, you know, turn up secrets and whatever, because those secrets are going to affect other people. And sometimes some people just exist and something happens somewhere. It, they, it shouldn't affect them, but then that trouble lands at their do doorstep and suddenly they have to show up, right? And be present and active in the story. So that's kind of what happens with that um, character we're speaking of. Um, she pretty much is just living her life and then randomly trouble shows up at her doorstep and she has this chance to say I'm gonna let I'm gonna just not let this thing um affect my life I'm gonna like push it aside and let it like pass on and for a moment there she almost does that she's like mm, I'm just gonna push all of this away and like you know but then something clicks there and I think this is one of this is the point where I was like okay this is gonna be a main character is where she sort of Ask her, ask her, ask herself what is worth saving about the current situation, right? And sometimes you're so like stable in the status quo, uh, and you don't want to get out of it. But sometimes you then ask yourself, what is so special about the status quo? Why is it better than whatever else is out there? And really, to be honest, that's kind of the situation. That's what all the characters in this book are asking themselves: Why is the status quo okay? Can't we? you know, find something better for ourselves, but also for others, maybe. Um, and this character sort of asks herself that question. And in my head, right, when I started, when I put in that character, it was just like, as you said, oh, you know, just a placeholder. She's going to say, okay, I'm not going to be involved in this, carry on. Um, but then she doesn't. She answers the question in the same way the main characters do. Um, the status quo is not sufficient. I want more. And then suddenly she starts to become a central part of everything because because wanting more always means that it always means you become <laughs> central to you know your own narrative you know journey but also that of something that becomes a collective which is what happens in the book I, i'll say one more thing and then i'll shut up so they can talk but I, I i think part of the reason i like that so much is because out of all of the different examples of, of types of bravery that someone can show or courage and things like that. There is the, the courage to um, let go of the status quo and to allow things to change, even if you don't have control of that change. That's a, a specific kind of courage that I think uh, we could use more of. And I, I love the way it's portrayed, not just by that character, but by many of the characters in your book. So your turn, um, Sorry, we have a little... 
a little scripture I was just looking um you have uh so you have like real villains um in the story uh that <laughs> seem to be it <laughs> seem to be systems and the cultures um the characters live in uh how do you change that how do you change the process of of plotting a book does it uh run the risk of glorifying the bad like uh like kind of like Darth Vader type characters things like that mm. So I'm just I'm doing, I'm going to repeat that back to you just to be sure I'm clear. Um, so in having villains, right, in this book, um, right? Am I correct? Yeah, the, the the villains are kind of like the systems in the book. Like in some ways, right. it's not yeah. so much the characters as the systems right. that they right. live in right. are the, right. the real bad things. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, so <laughs> yeah, I, I I one of the things I wanted to think about was. Um, Yes, it's a lot of this book is about systems. It's about uh, it's about lines drawn around people, and the few who are willing to overstep those lines for personal reasons, for personal glory, for, you know, for selfish reasons or for good or whatever. And where what path does that lead them toward? Right. Um, sometimes it happens in the form of a mistake. Uh, and, and then sometimes it happens in the form of willful, you know, like powering through. And, and I guess what I was going to say is um, assist, I guess part of what I was trying to say with the book um, in retrospect was even though systems exist and can be constraining um, and detrimental in many ways, the response to the system is also um, important, like how people respond to the system, even when sometimes the response has um, one or two actions that seem at first to be um, disruptive or like problematic. And then later down the line, they become, you realize that in the greater scheme, grand scheme of things, they kind of were just like one drop in the pond. And then on the other hand, there are some people who start out and it sounds like what they're doing is good, but then somewhere down the line, you see the bigger picture and realize, oh no, this person is actually probably worse than this system. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah it, it's kind of like that interplay is what I was trying to go for there. Um, or, or the system letting someone down. The yeah, misplaced, exactly. Misplaced so, faith in the system. Exactly, exactly. So it's like, there's there are these systems that um, a lot part of what I was trying to do was even make the systems like, um, and I know we're using the word systems here a lot, but um, <laughs> it, it, it's pretty much a lot of the time we want someone to be the figurehead for something like this person is the cause of this thing, right? Um, you know, the the Darth Vader and we have the, the, the you know, Death Star. So you want to have symbols for these bad, big, bad things. But a lot of the time it's not like that it's just like a lot of many players in their own corner of this really vile system and they're just like reaping off that vile system in different ways mm -hmm. so uh what i wanted was actually to have different each person to have a different antagonist or you know some for some the antagonist is straight up the system but it manifests in like one tiny person um, and there's the scene in the book, for instance, where this someone has to show up in the office, right, in the governmental office and like report. And there's this government person from the government, right, who works for the government, who is like just a regular low level bureaucrat or whatever, and literally gives this person hell. And in that moment, that person is the embodiment of that system. That person is the antagonist. Um, and so, yeah, I was trying to do that across the board. Um, for some people, the antagonist or the system itself does have a face. For some people, it doesn't. It's just like various oppressive things, you know, pulling their weight down on them. Some people, as Ray said, believe in that system actually and, and actually hope to get some, you know, to rise even out of the failure of the system or, or something or like use it to, to their advantage. Some of them actually still believe in the truth or the little truths that the system tells uh, of itself, which are not necessarily truths, but they believe them anyway. Um, yeah, so it's all of these things interplaying that I was really going for. Uh, and, and and that really, again, does one one of those things where, you know, it does, there's no dark lord. Um, there's just many pe bad people, <laughs> or, 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 or are they even bad people, right? <laughs> it's, it's more of like, they're all just working the system. 
and they're happy to do it ruthlessly in whatever way. It, it reminded me a lot of what we saw over the past, well, we still see it somewhere, yeah. but <laughs> what we've really seen over the past several years of yeah. people who just say, well, you know, I, I trust whatever political party they may belong to, exactly. whatever they say must be right, and yeah. uh, or they're going to fix everything, and that, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, with, without being a direct allegory, it was a very good allegory. <laughs> like, like there's, I can't, I can't draw direct lines from. Look, here's what he meant. This was his. But yeah. at the same time, the overarching sentiment was really resonant. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, it was. Um, sometimes you get inspiration from the places from not, you know, from things that are not so great. So, uh, <laughs> I'm blessing in disguise, I guess. Yeah. Um, the. So, and just, and I think this is kind of the last in the book question, um, mm. but uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a whole lot of, oh shit moments in this book. I mean, there's a lot <laughs> of, that. there was one particular moment where I, you know, I was out on my porch sitting there reading and like, I almost stood up with, oh no, not that. And like, oh yes, you know, this is, this is happening. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and also, um, you're not you're not quite as bad as some George Martin, <clears throat> but um, <laughs> you know it's it's not always predictable which characters are going to make it to the end of the book and which ones aren't. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and uh, it really it really shows you know your your love of of telling a good tale, not just drawing from the thing, but but turning turning these characters into a story. Mm -hmm. um, and I found myself kind of curious, like what's on your What's on your bookshelf? What's on your list of favorite movies? Like, what kind of things uh, did you, you know, have you always liked as far as twists in literature or in movies or things? Mm, um, yeah, I have a very weird relationship with twists. I don't always, I never set out to write them. Um, I, I have, I never planned twists. Um, often twists in my book or stories happen as a result of me getting somewhere and saying, hmm, what is the most likely unexpected thing? Or what's the most likely thing that's going to happen here? And then I'm like, I'm doing not that. <laughs> I'm doing not that. You know, I'm going to do something else that is not part of what is expected here. And expectation, of course, comes from, you know, um, the cultural diet, right, in terms of like genres and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm always like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. But another thing is I also come from a culture where storytelling is slightly different from like the dominant, you know, cultures of Hollywood and, and big publishing and all of that. So, so sometimes I'm even just like literally drawing from something I think would seem like um, obvious. <laughs> um, Especially like to be like if I showed it to my sister, for instance, they'd be like, "Yeah, I kind of saw that coming." And then there's people who are like, "Oh no, I did not see that coming." And and so there's that too, right? <laughs> <laughs> there's that too. Um, some a lot of it is like what is informing what you see coming, right? Um, and 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 how I'm sort of like pulling from all these different places to sort of inform my story in a way that it is. Uh, so, so this is the thing that often happens where folks are like, I'm not sure what I just read when, and I'm like, that is exactly kind of the point because like, there's some threads where you're like, I get this, but then what is this? Um, and that's what I'd like to do with my work yeah. anyway. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's the whole it. point. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, you get this part. That's great. All right. Because that is who I am as a person. Right. I've I spent time like grew up on a cultural diet of like Hollywood and stuff like that. And so I know these tropes, but at the same time, I don't want to write about them because that's what I've consumed the whole time. But I also come from this other culture where um, I have these rich stories that I will also bring in. And then there's also me trying to subvert some things or, as I said, be tangential in some way. And so when you put these together, you have this mostly mix that's not always completely recognizable, but parts of it are by various people, right? Um, and so that's kind of what I do. Um, so sometimes what is a twist isn't even really a twist. Sometimes it is, you know, the whole fun is not knowing which is which, which is great for me. <laughs> as the author um and yeah so i don't uh when it comes to so another thing favorites right you asked me what my favorite pieces of work right um 
film or whatever yeah. literature or your are, favorite twist the things that resonate with you yeah or a twist and the answer is i sidestep favorites which is exactly what i'm gonna do now um because <laughs> because well played, sir. Uh, well played. <laughs> <laughs> because i do not um uh, i have favorites at different times you know i my journey as an as a consumer right of words of you know um, stories it has been like meandering you know uh, i enjoyed some things and then i came to understand what they're really about i was like oh okay so i uh, you know i had a different view and i've gone to a point where i only always have i often always have work that i'm that i'm that i'm thinking about as I write at the moment for a period, right? Um, so I can only talk about, say, the last, what I've consumed in the last, say, three years, four years, five years, you know? That's what is really, I'm thinking about when it's informing uh, what I'm writing. So I can name three things. Uh, <laughs> one story that has stuck with me, for instance, is um, a story that was in light speed, I think in like 2015, it's called, no, I think it was in Nightmare Magazine, okay? Sister Magazines, anyway, it's called, uh, Hungry Daughters of Starving Mothers. It was by Alisa Wong. Um, it's a hard story, but it really does a lot of like subversion, right? About, um, it does this thing where it mixes, you know, cultural expectations around like horror stories and like um, women, women as the, you know, recipients of a lot of the violence that happens in horror films and what, and, and so it subverts that, uh, but in a way that is, kind of recognizable, but also not, and, you know. I, so I think of some works like that as ways to sort of bring this motley mix that I was talking about. Um, recently, I've read a work like, um, I, I recently read a novella by P. J. Lee Clark. It's called Ring Shout. Um, and again, that's, I'll call it dark fantasy. Uh, it's also historical, but it does this thing where it, again, mixes like the history, the present and the future, especially when you're thinking about Af the African descended experience. Um, and that when that, when that, um, when those African roots exist in a space that is not always, um, um, always present, right, in, in, of usual works, right? Um, in that, I think it's like 1920s prohibition Georgia, uh, but there's like monsters and 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 there's the KKK, but they're not really the KKK we know and stuff like that. So he does all of these things. And again, that's one of the works that, uh, that's a work like that is one I would often look at and think, hmm, you know, how is this work engaging with all these facets of that I want to bring together? How is it commenting on the past? How is it commenting on the future? How is it commenting on the present and stuff like that? Um, but how is it also subverting things in a way that, you know, as Grace says, you go, oh shit, when you get to a point. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I think about works like that, you know, just in general. First of all, uh, Lisa Wong is amazing. Uh, love her. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, one thing you said is uh, kind of comparing like this Western Hollywood storytelling to the storytelling that you grew up with. When you say that, what kind of like aspect of that for you is the biggest difference? I'm sorry if that's mm. not like an easy way, easy no, answer, but. It, it makes sense. Um, it's a valid question. Um, I think I would start with the first being, so a lot of, a lot of, uh, this is, this is a very, uh, what's the word, complicated subject, but like yeah. a lot of say African storytelling didn't always, make its way to writing early. So the forms that came out of African descended storytelling were mostly oral, right? Mm -hmm. Oral storytelling forms, right? Not just so we're talking form, structure, voice, literally all the things we'd say, hey, craft, um, and this is the way things are meant to sound, blah, blah, blah. But when you come from a place where storytelling is mostly oral, the structures, the tone, the you know, voice, the way world building is done is slightly different from a culture that has very strong written um, storytelling uh, patterns, right? And, and, and sort of, um, sort of, 
comparing both, I wouldn't even say comparing both because when you grow up in sort of like a space like that, especially a post-colonial space, you end up having both at the same time and you emerge with something that is neither nor the other, one or the other, right? Somewhere in the middle. Uh, and, and then when you make your way out into the world and start to tell stories, you then have to choose again, right? How hard you want to lean on one or the other. Uh, it's not always great having to make that decision. Um, you know, you, you tell a story and then folks would be like, but what if, or hmm. And when they say hmm, what they mean is, this is strange to me. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> and it, it doesn't really quite fit into this, you know, written idea of what I expect a written story to sound like, which is true because it doesn't, because it's not coming from, you know, such a place. So um, that's a very good example of some of the things I think about. I think about um, how, how, are, how are we telling stories or how are, are the people in the stories, even who are telling their stories in the story, how are they telling that, you know, how do they frame their thinking? Um, when people write official documents in from oral cultures, for instance, do they, does it sound very informal? It probably does. It probably sounds like Twitter, I would expect. <laughs> because, um, but that will be like the official archives of the governor of, you know, whatever. But at the same time, I wouldn't expect that, you know, coming from, say, um, the, you know, EG, a good example is like the Declaration of Independence. It has this very, you know, uh, orator well, it has this very like formal, you know, appreciation or whatever. And even what formal is sort of changes, you know, so all of these things, um, I tend to think about them a lot when I write. Um, and I guess what I often do is um, to decide that I want to, um, like I, I sort of like, I'd say pick my battles. I choose, okay, so this makes sense to move in this direction with, but this one I'm going to hold on to. I'm going to like make sure this represents itself, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a choice. I, I guess I always make, it's a choice. I think people have to make on to varying degrees, depending on what their, um, connection to other storytelling forms and patterns are, uh, and how, how much, how, in, in how that has helped to form how they tell their own stories. Right. Um, so yeah, that's just one good example. Deep cuts. <laughs> Deep cuts at world builders. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we are, are big fans of here at World Builders is the, the illustrators. Uh, we had there's probably at least two, at least two of them, if not more, in our chat right now. Um, and uh, we're always interested to hear about how the the cover choice. It sounds like you're really happy with your cover. As you, it's a beautiful print you have there behind mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> There's a ton of buzz around it online. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, how much uh, how much control do you have in working with the the artist's representation there? And and how does that how how do you like it? <laughs> I guess is what you, the, the process. Well, I, I'd say I was very lucky to start with. Um, on a, on a, you know, for many reasons. So often, often, right, what is more, more common is uh, control is not a word that um, authors can use very much in publishing. <laughs> um, so input, maybe control, no, probably not. <laughs> um, so, so in this case, I was lucky on two counts. The first is that I was working with Nivia Evans, who is literally, I think, the only Black woman in big five publishing in science fiction and fantasy globally, right? As, as a senior editor. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I know it sucks, but <laughs> yeah. So I, I was working, yeah. With, with someone who's like a, a tastemaker in that sense, right. Who's really thinking about these things as much as I am. And one of the discussions we had very early on was about covers and, 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 and Nivia said, um, you know, so she sent me like these, these are the kind of covers that like, Orbit does, right? And I was like, cool. What if <laughs> we don't do that? <laughs> um, and she was like, you know what? Yes, let's let's do your what if. <laughs> and so nice. um, one of the things that often comes out is like, they, they, uh, so I don't know if you guys have noticed this as readers, but like um, adult 
fantasy novels don't often have characters in on the covers. That often goes to YA, right? Because you you're trying to think about connecting to like a very um, specific audience and you want like the person right mm -hmm. but um adult sff especially with fantasy has often has this like epic scope especially with epic fans right there's like a capture of like a world or like a you know it's often like very pulled back and we're like but what if we did not do that what if we did the complete opposite <laughs> and went in <laughs> and, and so we did that um and so what, what Nivea had me do, so when, when she came back to me and said, hey, we've had um, Dan Dos Santos, who's awesome. And I looked up Amazing. Dan's work. I was like, yeah, you get it. You get it. So uh, what I did, uh, what I was, uh, we, we did was I pulled up uh, a document where uh, we're like, okay, on the cover, we're going to have this main character, right? Um, give me, I was asked to pretty much provide everything. Um, what clothing give me an actor reference i had to like my 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 wife ended up picking the actor who was the actor reference because i was like who i don't tell me give me and she was like you know i got you i got you and then she found <laughs> um the actor and then um you know and then i pulled you know photos of my clothing um the the, the facial painting um references the hairstyle references uh, and I pulled all of that and I was like, Dan, here you go, you know, do with it what you will. Um, and then Dan came back with this. I was like, wow, I'm working with like the most awesome people ever. <laughs> um, and then when Nivea sent this to me, she was like more like squee. And I was like, squee right back. It was, it was awesome. <laughs> Um, I'm dropping into the chat right now a little um, something special for you guys. It's actually Dan Dos Santos talking about um, working on your cover. On this cover, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Um, he's a great, great artist. We had a couple of his works in our last uh, in our last fundraiser, and um, yeah, it's it's really interesting to hear about the author's point of view working with the artist. Because often we're kind of at Water Builders this in between where we then have authors or the artists make other work, but we're not authors, so we don't right. get to see this like kind of interaction. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm so glad you had a great experience, a unique cover for like a very unique storytelling, and it fits nice. Um, I'm curious. We do have uh, if we can keep you for a couple more minutes. We're past sure. one. Um, there. We had a lot of people over, uh, obviously, the COVID pandemic, and you're uh, going to be in the middle of a release um, that's kind of on the edge of missing this pandemic, but now, yeah. like, maybe things will open yeah. up again. Do you, <laughs> yeah. what do you see for that? Do you, do you guys, are you planning, like, in-person stuff, or? No, no. Um, <laughs> and this is not, uh, like, a failure on the publisher's part or anything. Um, it's 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 more me um i because because it's it's likely going to be like happening at the exact time when people are still tentative about exactly how mm -hmm. to come back out there's going to be a lot riding on you know safety and precautions and all of that and i mean if people are like readers and they love this work i don't want to put them in that situation about having to choose between coming to see me or like literally contracting some really deadly virus so um so i was just like flat out from the beginning i was like if we if we like don't know and the world as a whole hasn't started to make these moves then just just you know, let's just go with the go with the flow i'd rather have you know people tune in who can tune in uh and and do this virtually but the other thing is also because um a lot when when a lot of these things happen in person it, it tends to cut off a lot of people from the global south that I am from who want to engage with me and see me and do all, and I'm like this provides a much better opportunity for that to happen so on the strength of that alone it was almost a no-brainer I was like of course of course I want to do more things that loop in people that often wouldn't have been able to attend and and participate so so yeah, it was it was just like flat out. We'll do virtual stuff. Uh, we'll try as much as possible to spice it up, uh, as much as the time and energies will allow. But um, but yeah, it's mostly going to be virtual. 
Well, we uh, we appreciate. I can I can <clears throat> share at least according to, to Ellen Wright. Um, you've agreed to come back when it's closer to the uh, time yeah. of the release and, and join us yep. again. Um, I'm hoping maybe we can get some uh, some books to you and maybe we can do a virtual signing or something like that. Sure. Um, and uh, and work with that. We we really enjoyed having you and we're going to say normally we do a lightning round at the end where we talk about you know very specific things but i think we're going to save okay. that since we're running late today we'll save that for the next time um you come in come in with us um we really really appreciate uh, not only that you came here but also this is just a fantastic book i, I i'm going to be trying <laughs> to you. you know buy this for my grandson and things like that because <laughs> this is this is just really great stuff and i'm someone who um got burned out on the typical stuff that you find in epic fantasies. Um, and so this is, it was just incredibly refreshing. Um, and I, I really, I, I hope it has all of the success that it, it deserves and then some. It's, Thank you, I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed that. <laughs> um, so I think we go into, huh, close, tune to next week, yeah. Um, next week is gonna be a weird one, um, <laughs> which is that we are going to be uh, instead of having a guest per se, we're going to be having um, a Xeno Hunters playthrough of a new game that's coming out from Half Monster. Um, but before we do that, I'm being reminded that we have to do the drawing for this <laughs> particular book itself. So oh, wow. yes, um, last chance to put in an entry. If you do not put in an entry, it's exclamation point storm. Um, and we will, yep, Scroise is doing the drum roll. And go ahead and do the drawing, Jamie. Winner is, winner is somewhere. <laughs> See, this is a lesson in dramatic <laughs> tension. Mubata is doing its best. <laughs> Hey, Jewel the Fox. Yay. Yay, yay. Excellent. Congrats. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> You're going to love it. Um, cool. We will get that shipped out to you shortly. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we, we, we've heard orders from you before. So if not, um, our, uh, our producer will contact you for the to verify your shipping uh, information. So cool. Um, but yeah, next week, tune in for a, a exciting playthrough of Xeno Hunters, which is kind of like a board game version of uh, Aliens, <laughs> the movie. <laughs> um, and uh, always remember, if you go to worldbuildersmarket.com, we are always updating it with new books and new materials and things. We're also getting revved up for our Geeks Doing Good showcase in June. So we'll be having all kinds of new stuff. Right. Keep an eye out for more stuff from uh, Suyi Okamboa. You also have a really great uh, YouTube channel that people can uh, <laughs> um, find you at. I think it's Suyi, Suyi Recommends. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's it. But uh, yeah, and thanks again for coming on. Um, should we do our word, Gray? Uh, yeah. So we, yeah, we do a, a word at the end so that... Um, we can make sure that we know that we are cut off before we start talking trash about the audience and stuff. Um, so uh, the word of the day is, it, originally it was the Latin word vivamus, but that became too predictable. So now we do a version of it in serious ways. So we're gonna say it's stormamus. Oh, look at that, Scoy's guessed it, but stormamus. Yes, he almost got it. All right, there, there we are. We are. Okay. <laughs>